Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Aloha. Welcome to Think Tech Hawaii and my show today, Making Leadership Work, with my special guest, Kim Koko Iwamoto. Welcome, Kim. Thank you, Carol. Kim is Kim Koko is running for lieutenant governor in mm -hmm. a crowded race this right. year. Uh, she and I served on the State Board of Education mm -hmm. uh, just before it changed to from an elected board to an appointed board. That's right. I did. So I wanted to ask you, so first of all, tell us, Kim, why are you running for lieutenant governor? Well, if I can quote one of my political inspirations, Nina Turner, not any blue will do. I think uh, <laughs> within the Democratic Party, um, especially in Hawaii, you know, although although they are more socially um, liberal, there's a lot of fiscal conservatism that actually makes our state look more Republican in terms of the way we not the way we um, don't adequately fund public education. Our mental health services, um, the fact that we have the homeless crisis at a level that's beyond any other state in the nation, um, our lack of affordable housing, all of these issues are issues that Republicans don't care about. And that's concerning to me as a, as a Democrat and as a progressive Democrat who cares about Hawaii's people. Okay, so you, I know you identify yourself both as, a, of course, a lawyer, you're trained yes. as a lawyer, uh, and an environmentalist, yes. so you mentioned environmental issues. Right. So exactly how do you propose to, as Lieutenant Governor, change our current uh, situation in Right, well, you know, first of all, we have to look at the way the Lieutenant Governor's office has been underutilized. Um, it is the same exact footprint as the governor's office. It's the same size. It's just on the Eva wing of the Capitol. And it has a large staff. And yet we see very little coming out of that office. And it's no offense to any of the previous lieutenant, the current or the previous lieutenant governors. Um, but I do think what we see oftentimes are lieutenant governors are silent um, understudies to the governor. They just see themselves as waiting their turn, perhaps waiting for the, something to happen to the governor, God forbid. But, you know, I, there, there seems to be a lack of initiative. Again, when we hear about the, the huge disparity of econo economic power in Hawaii, um, you know, everyday families, another family slipping one step closer to homelessness. Um, it's too, we have too much of an urgent situation for anybody to just be sitting around waiting to be assigned a task by the governor. Um, I think that office could become the people's office and we have a great opportunity to bring the people who've been working on the front lines of issues like homelessness, the environment, economic justice, bring them, make that be their office. They can convene meetings. They invite in key legislators and executive administrative people, and everyone get on the same page and do substantive change in a timely fashion. Right now, the current model, a lot of the activists go door knocking at the legislature, and the le oftentimes uh, legislators go, "Oh, well, that's too much. That's too, you know, that's not practical. We have to be pragmatic about that," and they nickel and dime an issue to death. Literally, by the time anything gets implemented, the problem's gotten so much worse that whatever tiny little solution they were going to offer is no longer appropriate. Um, and so we're changing the whole dynamic of what we could see that office being. But uh, that's a wonderful point, except that statutorily or constitutional authority of the lieutenant governor right. is limited. Actually, Carol, um, so I know, I know you're an attorney, and I'm a sure attorney, we've read the Constitution and what's outlined in the statute, and actually there is nothing prohibiting the lieutenant governor from taking a more active role. The lieutenant go governor is elected by the people and therefore accountable to the people. There's really nothing stopping a lieutenant governor from convening meetings. And I do that myself as an individual community organizer. Mm -hmm. I convene people who are working on um, prison reform issues and they meet in my home and they hold meetings and everyone strategizes about how we're going to proceed. Um, and I partner with different organizations mm -hmm. and we get on the same page. We're doing it now. People are doing it now. But what happens is that the Capitol, even the design of the Capitol, when you look at it and if you ever visit the Capitol, it's built like a fortress. It's built in a way to keep the people away from the, the decision makers. Think about that. It's sometimes it's hard to find how do you get upstairs, right? Everything's hidden, like the entryways are hidden, the stairs are hidden, everything's hidden. 
Um, but I think we can totally change that if the people are on the fifth floor, which is where the lieutenant governor's office is, I think they'll definitely be more integrated access to solving our problems collectively. So I disagree that there is any kind of statutory or constitutional limitation on what the governor can do as a convener, as a mobilizer, as an advocate for the people. I see, and the lieutenant governor. Lieutenant, is right, that, yes, exactly. the lieutenant governor. Okay, so uh, assuming that we get through the fortress and we get upstairs <laughs> yes. to the fifth floor. That's right. So then, once you've convened these wonderful organizations and come up with maybe an action plan, how will you implement any right. decision making? And that's for, once again, the people who are working on the front lines of a particular situation. I'm not going to be the kind of candidate that says I have the answers, because I have not been working for decades, as many of my friends and um, colleagues have, on issues they've been living, they've been fighting the fight every day. And I would never want to disrespect their um, degree of knowledge about the issue nor their understanding of what kind of solutions we need. So I would defer, I would just try to create um, a, a stronger platform. Corporations are spending millions of dollars to make sure their voices are elevated at the Capitol. I just want to make sure that the people's voice is heard, right? Their concerns, their solutions, the people. It's their, it's their capital. Okay. Yes, and yes, and if I may share something of actually about the the, the corporatocracy that we kind of exist in, um, I was at a meeting at the Hawaii Community Venture, um, the Hawaii Venture Capitalist Association, and one of the uh, government spokesperson was there, and they actually said that the corporate tax rate in Hawaii is one of the lowest in the nation. So think about that: the corporate tax rate in Hawaii is one of the lowest. They are under-investing from our revenue, tax revenue position. They're under-investing, yet they have one of the largest voices. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a problem. So is that something then that you would support, is raising the corporate uh, taxes? Or taking away, you know, it's not even about just raising the corporate tax rate. It's about getting rid of all of the tax credits they get. You know, like for instance, we give um, uh, real estate investment uh, tax credits for the person who builds an air-conditioned storage facility on the same footprint that we used to have affordable housing. We're actually saying here, we're, we're, we are rewarding sure. them mm -hmm. for building air-conditioned storage facilities in the urban core. Think about that. Think about driving around Honolulu. Oh, look, here's another air-conditioned storage facility. Know that that investor got tax credits from Hawaii. And Instead so of role. using that for affordable housing. I'm sorry for oh, no I'm just so excited yes, to you bring are. all these issues to you. And so then as Lieutenant Governor, how could you change that? Well, I think making sure everyone's on the same page. Mm -hmm. When one of the things that really um, frustrates me as, as, a, as, a, as a voter, as an active participant in our democracy, is when I see other elected officials they know the shenanigans that's going on at the legislature, but everyone's silent. No one wants to rock the boat. No one wants to out somebody's conflict of interest. You know, and I, that, to me, we have a very polite culture. And unfortunately, that politeness has put us on a trajectory that isn't a good one. We're not going to survive if we stay on the current path, if we remain in the status quo. Okay. I mean, think about it, homelessness, affordable housing, the cost of living, the rate of pay, everything is so out of whack here. And I'm sorry, and you know, uh, we, we can do better, is, is what I'm saying, and we need to start that healing process uh, so that we can be strong and vibrant um, by actually checking people, checking elected officials. You're getting a lot of money from Monsanto. You're getting a lot of money from Syngenta and Dow and all these multinational agrochemical corporations. And you're blocking now. After you're getting all that money, you're saying, go ahead and spray next to our schools. So are you saying then that your role as lieutenant governor, in addition to uh, convening and bringing in people from various interests, um, the public mm -hmm. to your office and articulating issues and maybe coming up with an action plan, the step of actually implementing any plan would be to somehow persuade, whether it's corporate or um, individuals who have some kind of a, a 
uh, obligation or loyalty to some particular interest, but yeah. I'm not sure exactly how you as lieutenant governor well, have that. Yes. Well, authority. first of all, I think it's really important that the people know that somebody is speaking on their behalf. I mean, truly, that I'm not, or whoever is in that position is not beholden to any special interest group, not beholden to anybody but the people who elected her into that position. Mm -hmm. That needs to be affirmed mm -hmm. constantly mm -hmm. by speaking the truth, by speaking the truth to the power, mm -hmm. to the establishment. I mean, our democratic, we are truly a very blue state, like I said earlier, in, in quoting Nina, Nina Turner, not any blue will do. We are a very blue state, but that's, that does nothing for us if we don't hold the Democrats mm -hmm. to the Democratic Party platform, which is very progressive. When you think about the hard work that the people who are in the party, in the field, in the community level, they go through all of, they develop resolutions, they create the party platform. They spend a lot of time debating issues and they adopt a progressive platform. And then when people who run for office claim that they're Democrats, they're not held accountable to the party platform. And that needs to change. And then people get frustrated. I'm frustrated. So I think that's a start. So it's just a start mm -hmm. to clearing the field and calling, you know, calling, calling truth out and then working and building from there. Okay, so um, I assume when you decided to run for lieutenant governor, you analyzed whether you could run for um, legislature or even yeah, the governor's you know, position. Right. And, and, and for me, I just said, what is the most underutilized office? Where can I have the greatest impact given what's already, what's currently available in, in the marketplace, right? Who can turn it? Right now, I'm running against uh, other candidates who are part of the status quo who've invested heavily, heavily into keeping Hawaii on the path that it's on right now. Mm -hmm. You know, are they, gonna, are they gonna challenge the state to become better? I, you know, are they, do they even have that capacity? Right. Do they have the courage to mm -hmm. do that? Um, I, I question that, mm -hmm. and, but I do know who I am and I do know the fights I've been fighting all my life and I know that I'm willing to fight for the people of Hawaii. Well, let's talk about some of your fights because of course <laughs> you're known as a community activist. Right. And so tell us yes. a little bit more about. Thank you for asking. That. And this is how we met Carol on the Board of Education. In 2008 so, right. when I was elected. And I was elected in 2006. Uh -huh. And I ran for the Board of Education because um, I was foster parenting at that time actually from 2004 to 2006. And I was a foster parent to teenagers, uh, teenagers who've been homeless, teenagers who um, were actually, I pulled some teenagers out of the youth correctional facility because their parents wouldn't sign them out. Mm. So they were left in pr youth prison to just rot away. It was really bad. Um, so I, I worked, you know, I got licensed as a therapeutic foster parent and I um, would take these kids into my home, open my my, um, my heart and my home to them. And in my role as their parent, I was also their education advocate, mm -hmm. making sure that they were getting the resources and the access to public education that they deserved. Um, so in working with them, and, and, and many of them were being bullied and harassed at school. Um, some of them were gay, some of them were transgender, and they said to me they were being bullied and harassed and would try to make complaints to the principal, but they were falling on deaf ears. So I, they asked me, would you please come with us and testify at the Board of Education? So of course, I'm gonna, that's my role as your parent to um, advocate on your behalf for your safety and your access to education. So I did that. I te we testified about the state of the situation for them and others like them. And literally, the Board of Education stared back very blankly. There was no acknowledgement. Once again, this is why it's important that the voice at the table is affirming what the people are saying. So there was no indication, no acknowledgement that that was not OK, that the kids deserved better. Uh, so I realized or that they would be accountable or they had a plan of action to make it, to change it from the current path it was on. So I realized at the moment, you know what, these kids, my kids, kids of Hawaii, they need an advocate at the table 
on the Board of Education. So I decided to run in 2006. Wonderful. And yeah, with the help of a lot of family, friends, kids, uh, a lot of y young people, uh, we took to the streets and sign waved and, and put up signs. And uh, 16 people were in that race that year. Um, and we were able to come into the top three, which is what we needed. And we Great. were able, once we did get on the board of it, we were able to implement a lot of the changes around bullying and harassment that the kids wanted. And you were part of that change then when you came on too. Right. Wow. Well, uh, on that interesting note, we're going to take a short break. We'll be right back. So we're with our guest, Kim Koko Iwamoto, a candidate for lieutenant governor. And we'll be right back. Hi, I'm Ethan Allen, host of Likeable Science on Think Tech Hawaii. Every Friday afternoon at 2 p.m., I hope you'll join me for Likeable Science, where we'll dig into science, dig into the meat of science, dig into the joy and delight of science. We'll discover why science is indeed fun, why science is interesting, why people should care about science, and care about the research that's being done out there. It's all great, it's all entertaining, it's all educational, so I hope you'll join me for Likeable Science. Aloha, I'm Kili'i Akina, and I'm here every other week on Mondays at 2 o'clock p.m. on Think Tech Hawaii's Hawaii Together. In Hawaii Together, we talk with some of the most fascinating people in the islands about working together, working together for a better economy, government, and society. So I invite you into our conversation every other Monday at 2 p.m. on Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. Join us for Hawaii Together. I'm Kili'i Akina. Aloha. Welcome back. This is Carol Mon Lee on uh, Think Tech Hawaii's Making Leadership Work with my special guest, Kim Koko Iwamoto, a uh, lawyer and environmentalist who is currently running for lieutenant governor for the state of Hawaii. So, welcome back. Thank you for having me. So, among I know your many community activities is the current one that we're all interested in is, of course, the Women's Movement, the Women's March. Right. And I think we have one Im image that we can show to our um, right. Viewers, uh, show us. So let's describe this picture for our right. viewers. Right. So here we, we're. Um, the way I like to my campaign, I like to have a win-win situations. And so in this picture, um, my my supporters and volunteers on my campaign, instead of just marching in the ML, well, this is actually from the MLK parade um, at Magic Island. That's the beginning. So you just know, just this recent. This is Martin from the King. recent MLK uh -huh. parade. Mm -hmm. And so what we do is we like to fuel the resistance. Uh, that's our model. Um, instead of because we we're in all of this together. Right. right? And so, so it shows you pulling a cart full of fruit. <laughs> yeah, healthy, healthy breakfast items because everyone runs out of the house to get to the parade on time. Mm -hmm. And they don't um, adequately feel for the for the march all the way to Kapilani Park. But we did the same thing at the Women's March uh -huh. too. And we called it Refueling the Resistance. I see. And again, it's that win-win opportunity where we get to engage with other, with other women, other activists, other allies, mm -hmm. and also share, share food and share. I mean, we're here to support each other. And that's okay. what, for me, me, that's what that um, that outreach was about. It's about saying what you're doing is important. I'm here. I got your back. Have a banana. Uh -huh. So you can continue marching. So you can continue fighting and we can continue fighting together. And that's what we need to do on a lot of issues. If we attach, I mean, if we, you know, pursue um, you know, issues around sexual harassment that way, domestic violence, if we do it as a unified front, we're going to get so much more. Um, and the same issue around homelessness, we mm -hmm. can do that so much That's your big issue for the state. That is, I think, the number one issue. And I have to share that when my first job as an attorney coming back to Hawaii, um, was I was the, um, I did clinics, legal clinics, free legal clinics and homeless shelters. That was my responsibility to make sure that the legal issues that may have put a person to homelessness, um, whether it was a financial situation and they couldn't declare bankruptcy and then their wages were being garnished and suddenly they can't afford to pay their rent and they find themselves on the street. Um, we had bankruptcy clinics at that time. The bankruptcy laws were a little different in 2001. Um, of course, the corporations, the financial corporations, lobbied and made it much more difficult for people to declare bankruptcy and to get away from creditors. And that's one of the reasons why we see more homeless people today, because if you can't escape the creditors, um, you then they garnish your wages, you cannot pay your landlord. Right. 
So that's part of the cycle. And what um, would you do now as lieutenant governor then to Well, I help think, him? you know, we, so there are federal bankruptcy laws, but we can also have our own statutes um, addressing some of these issues, and we do need to change them. Are there right? any right now in the legislature that are pending? Not or that I'm been aware. Introduced? I mean, mm -hmm. you know, there are three other candidates running this race. All you know, and they all recognize homelessness as being, you know, but are they looking at the root causes? Uh -huh. And I think that kind of critical analysis is is really important, uh -huh. and what sets me apart. Um, and you know, and I, as a so I do know about landlord tenant law. So when I mentioned earlier about what happens to families, um, I have an apartment building. So I'm a small business owner as well as an attorney environmentalist. Um, I'm a small business owner. I have an apartment building in, near Ala Moana Shopping Center. It's in the urban core. I purchased it when I was um, foster parenting because I wanted to have more flexibility. So I thought, you know, I'm going to fix this building up. Um, you know, I was literally, we tore down walls. It was kind of a slum. It was, we pulled down um, ceilings and we put new uh, drywall and I was holding the drywall up there. So I got really involved in fixing it up. Within the first year of owning that building, um, a realtor came by and said, you know, I, can, I have somebody who wants to buy your building for 100% uh, return your investment. And this was around in 2004. Like, oh my God, I'm like, I never thought this was possible. And it was tempting, but I said, you know what? How are my tenants? going to afford double the rent so that this new owner can afford double their mortgage. And I thought about it and said, you know what? I can either be part of the problem or part of the solution. Affordable housing in the urban core. We need more of that. I'm not going to sell out and create a situation where these local families couldn't afford to stay there any longer. So I kept it. And I have to tell you, it's been one of my most solid, strong investments mm -hmm. as a business owner. Um, it's it, and not only does it it have financial returns, right? And they're you know they're comfortable but excellent. They also have social impact returns. Of course, I mentioned this earlier. Win win. I don't like to sell myself short or the state short. We can have multiple wins. And so it, how again does this translate to the lieutenant governor's office to be? Able well, to, you know, having mm -hmm. a sense of understanding business. Mm -hmm. Having an understanding of the different pressures, the different incentives that, that create the problem. So if everyone's speculating on real estate, just not even as somebody's home, but as something you buy and trade, you buy and sell, buy and sell, and you're just getting these commissions and you're, you're flipping buildings, you're totally not paying attention to the human lives being impacted. Don't you think we need more people in government who are aware of the, the, the ramifications of just doing business in Hawaii? But one of the stories I wanted to share with you about my, my building where more than 50% of the units are housing previously homeless families, as well as families who would be homeless, but for the Section 8 voucher they receive. One of the families has been, was before moving into my building, was living uh, uh, in a van with his three kids for three years. He was working at the same job for seven years. Um, when he came and he saw one bedroom, that's all I had at the time, and he says, I'll take it. Because, I said, but it's not big enough for your family. He's like, it's way bigger than my van. Uh. Once he was able to have stabilized housing, he got a promotion. He got three raises. Within a year, he was no longer eligible for that subsidy. Amazing. Like, that's what we want to see. And I'm still able to pay for my mortgage. You know what I'm saying? That we can do this. We can do this, Hawaii. We can. We just need to do it together. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. that's, what I, that's what I'm saying. And I think it's important to show people that you're willing to, to uh, walk the talk. I see. You know? Well, we've, we've really covered, um, thank you, we've covered education, we've covered homelessness, we've covered a little bit about the environment. Did you want to talk something about some of your environmental um, issues? Yeah, well, you know, one of the things, actually, if you, the environment, you know who's addressing the environment ferociously? Uh, the neighbor islands. Maui, Kauai, the Big Island. There's so many environmental activists out there who are inspiring, inspiring. They are taking on their city councils, taking on the corporations. Um, but what's happening is our state legislature, because we're so Oahu-centric at the Capitol, um, their voices on the neighbor islands often go silenced. Maui, for instance, has created satellite offices and they are able to take remote testimony. 
they are able to engage in the political process remotely because you know there's a lot of rural areas. Yes, we can do that for our neighbor islands. We can do, we can set up remote satellite offices. So people can tell it. Tele testify um, at the legislature. Right now, a bill gets scheduled on the agenda. You have 48 hours to go buy a ticket, find a babysitter. You might have to find a place to stay, rent a car. That's so cost prohibitive for a lot of people on the neighbor islands to come. Can't we just set up a uh, mechanism with technology today to give them a voice? I know I, when I'm sitting in the hearing rooms at the Capitol, I would love to hear what the neighbor island mm -hmm. activists are doing and what their perspective. So many of the issues at the legislature, well, many of them specifically only affect some of the neighbor right. islands, mm -hmm. yet they have no voice. Mm -hmm. But you know who does have a voice? Corporate lobbyists. They have a very loud voice. The corporate lobbyists who want to take the water, mm -hmm. the water access, who want to take the land from the people on the, outer, on the neighbor islands, um, they have a voice at the legislature. They hire lobbyists, they spend millions of dollars, right? They are heard from often, loud and clear. So we have to shift this dynamic again. And you know, it's about making sure the people are heard. And it feels like the whole system is set up to um, not hear them and not value their contributions to our state as a whole. I see. Okay, well, let me um, backtrack a little bit on what the Lieutenant Governor's Office uh, used to do. They used to be in charge of elections, and that's been removed from their authority, from its authority. Do you think that that's something that should be reestablished? Um, yes, I think, again, there's so much more. What well, actually, yes, I'm sorry. I meant yes, that's something that we can look into. I think the reason why it was removed from that office, because it's an elected office. So it's conflict. kind of a little bit, you know, uh, weird to have an elected official in charge of the office of elections. So what do you think about um, right now the primary, the lieutenant governor is separately uh, voted on? And then the governor. So it's kind of like a blind marriage when it comes to the general election, right? You're paired no, up. No, you know what? I don't think of it that way. Mm -hmm. I think of it as we both serve. In, we would both serve in very important roles. Um, obviously, the governor has um, is the the lead of the state, right? There's no question about that. But I think it's important when you're thinking about a lieutenant governor candidate. Do you want somebody who's going to just always been lockstep? Who's going to keep this, all the secrets of the governor? You know, and I and I say that because there's an opportunity to be a voice of courage within the inner offices of the governor's office. To not be afraid to tell the emperor, "Excuse me, emperor, you have no clothes on." Excuse me, emperor, <laughs> you're deviating away from your own campaign promises. You're deviating away from the Democratic Party platform. I want to tell you this very gently, politely, and inside. Because if you continue on that path, um, I would need to, I cannot remain silent and complicit. Okay. Well, we just have a few more seconds left. First, I'd like to show uh, one last slide, and then you can look into camera four. And yes. what are we looking at on this slide? Oh, I am so honored to, when I started my campaign, the first call I made was to retired Judge Dan Foley. And... Um, you know, he's, and he's been an amazing, amazing uh, steward, uh, protector, stalwart protector of our liberties. He was with the ACLU previously. Right. He was the lead litigator on the same-sex marriage case. He, t he takes on the difficult fights. He has the courage and the intellect. And so I approached him, and he said he would love to be my chair. Great. What an honor. Do you have a parting message to our audience? Yes. The message is to please register and vote and make sure your voice is heard. And I'm gonna partner with you at the, at the, from the Lieutenant Governor's Office and make sure it's your office. Thank you, and on that note, maybe we can show one last slide uh, that we have with, with Maya. Uh, with Maya yes. Sotoro Inc. She reached out to my campaign after she heard my launch speech. Somebody did a Facebook Live of that speech and she happened to see it. And then she reached out and said, I wanna support your campaign. And on that note, I'm going to say thank you so thank much, you Kim so Coco. Much. Thank you, We Carol. wish you the best. I appreciate it. And thank again, you. my guest has been Kim Coco Iwamoto, who is running for lieutenant governor from the state of Hawaii. This is Carol Mon Lee, Think Tech Hawaii, and we'll see you next time. Aloha.